Good evening. Um, <laughs> no, no, it's not evening yet. Sorry. <laughs> good afternoon. Uh, it's good to be with you here today. I wish I could spend more time, uh, but we would be here for week two, three. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I won't keep you too long just now. I just wanted to show you something very, very interesting. Um, that whatever I said this morning in sermon and right now uh, is found in this little book. So let me just give you a little introduction to this. <clears throat> oh, we're going to have a little question here if we have time. Yeah, later. Okay. Uh, the book, I'll say it later in a moment. Okay. <laughs> All you need to know is in this little book. <laughs> I'll sell this book to you later for a profit. <laughs> Just kidding. You've got it all in your homes. Um, I'm hooked. I'm already hooked. Hooked on grace. <laughs> all right. So... Uh, when I was a child in Poland, when I was growing up, we had, uh, once a year, we had this big uh, competition in Poland. And the competition was when we would, yeah, young people would get into, you remember this, this competitions? We would get into one city in Poland, all the young people, and we've got a few Polish people here who remember this from Poland, and we would compete on the knowledge of Steps to Christ. <laughs> right? Remember this? So uh, I was living, grew up in Warsaw, in the center of Poland, and so our church had a team, and I was on the team once, and I remember reading Steps to Christ maybe 10, 15 times, trying to get the message, to understand, to learn what it is, so I could win the competition. Never won the competition. There were always better people than us who were absolutely brilliant. He knew all the answers. But so I read this book about 10, 15 times when I was teenager until the time I left Poland, in Polish, of course, but I never got the message. I was learning to win the competition, but not to, not to actually learn what she says. And then I went to school in Avondel first, but Avondel, I was learning to speak English at Avondel, uh, so that was not that uh, great. I didn't get much benefit from that, but then when, when I became a pastor in Sydney, after Three years of pastoring, we decided to go to America, my wife and I, and I engaged myself in master's program in theology and doctoral program in theology. Only after I completed those studies, I realized what a masterpiece this little book is. Uh, I, I look at uh, Ellen White, who wrote this book, and, and can say to you that it's amazing that somebody who had very little formal education was able to put such highly fine-tuned theologically argument of God's, for God's salvation. It's, it's, it's shocking. When you know all the other alternatives and you get to this, it's just like, really? This is just, just, just amazing, absolutely amazing. So I would like to just guide you through one chapter of this book, but the whole book is structured in the grace-oriented way of salvation, the entire book. The very first chapter talks about God's love for men, that God loves us so much and talks about his character, character of love and so on. She talks a lot about this. It's an amazing chapter about God, how God loved his in initiative through his love. The second chapter is even more amazing, the sinner's need of Christ. It doesn't sound like much, but in this chapter, she establishes the ground, what I was talking about in the morning and in all day today, that we are basically have basic inability. We cannot do anything for Christ because we, we've just, uh, we dead. Okay, she actually says that. It is impossible for us of ourselves to escape from the pit of sin in which we are sunken. Our hearts are evil. We cannot change them, you know? And she says that we desperately need Christ. And then the rest of the book is how Christ works with us. But there is a chapter here. This is chapter number seven that's entitled the test of discipleship, which is one amazing chapter. You know, it took me a lot of studying theology to really understand, to get what, what, it, what it's written here. It's amazing. You know, it's, it's just unbelievable. So I just would like to read to you a few, few things and explain a few things of what she says. 
And you will see that what I preach today is really very much in congruence with, with, with what we find here. So test of discipleship, she talks about a way of salvation. The character is revealed, she said, not by occasional good deed and occasional misdeed, but by tendency of the habitual words and acts. So the character is revealed by our life, you know, by a walk with Christ. And then she talks about uh, focusing on Christ, okay? That this, this, we need to focus on Jesus in order for his fruits to work from within us. So this is all the work of Christ. All the obedience is, is Christ in us. Okay, so when we obey the commandments, it is God, through his Holy Spirit, works in us to obey when we walk with Jesus. So, uh, and she talks about renewal by grace. This chapter is full of grace here. So let me read this. There are two errors against which the children of God, particularly those who have just come to trust in his grace, especially need to guard. The first already dwelt upon is that of looking to their own works. Trusting to, the, trusting to anything they can do to bring themselves into harmony with God. So you see, you can't bring yourselves to harmony with God with obedience to commandments. It's impossible. He who is trying to become holy by his own works in keeping the law is attempting an impossibility. All right? All that man can do without Christ is polluted with selfishness and sin. Uh, it is the grace of Christ alone through faith that can make us holy. So this theme of grace, the reformational theme, is very much, uh, very much present here. Then opposite and no less dangerous error is that belief in Christ releases men from keeping the law of God. That since by faith alone we become partakers of the grace of Christ, our works have nothing to do with our redemption. Immediate question is what are our works? What is it that our works are? And she answers in the very next statement. But notice here that obedience is not outward compliance, but a service of love. So obedience is not obedience to the Ten Commandments, it's obedience how we relate to one another in service uh, to love. She further on writes, obedience, the service and allegiance of love is a true sign of discipleship. She could have said, obedience to the Ten Commandments is a true sign of discipleship. She doesn't say that. Okay, she says, what's happening? I've just got to correct this for you, mate. All right, am I hooked again? Okay, so obedience is basically defined as the service and allegiance of love to Christ and to people around us. It's a true sign of uh, discipleship. And then she says, we do not earn salvation by our obedience. Did you hear this? Let me read it again. We do not earn salvation by our obedience. So what do we earn salvation by? By grace, by faith in Christ, by grace, not by our obedience whether it's allegiance to, of love or whether it's obedience to commandments. For salvation is the free gift of God to be received by faith, but obedience is the fruit of faith. Okay? So this is just wonderful, okay? My obedience is fruit of my relationship with Christ. So I do not work to be in relationship with Christ so I get to heaven. I live in relationship with Christ and he produces obedience within me. That's, that's what obedience is the fruit of faith, of the Holy, work of the Holy Spirit. If we abide in Christ, if the love of God dwells in us, our feelings, our thoughts, our purposes, our actions will be in harmony with the will of God as expressed in the precepts of his holy law. Isn't that amazing? You see, I gave you this example before about my daughters who said, we have no rules. Okay? How come there are no rules in the house? Okay? Because... They internalized the rules because they loved us, they love us, and they just internalized. They didn't even think there were any kind of rules, you know? And that's exactly what she says here. Our thoughts, our purpose, our actions will be in harmony, and we won't even know it because that's how God works. Okay, so, and, and then she makes a statement that some people take this little paragraph here and they close the book and say, this is what it is, okay? And it sounds kind of awful. The condition of eternal life is now just what it has always been, just what it was in paradise before the fall of our first parents. Perfect obedience to the law of God, perfect righteousness. If eternal life were granted on any condition short of this, then the happiness of the whole universe would be imperiled. The way would be open for sin, 
with all its train of woe and misery to be immortalized. And some people close the book at this thing, and I've seen collections of paragraphs from Ellen White sometimes where people would have this paragraph and, and that's it. Okay, and see, obedience, perfect obedience, and so on. But that's not what Ellen White, where Ellen White stops. The next paragraph is amazing. It was possible for Adam before the fall to form a righteous character by obedience to God's law, but he failed to do this. And because of his sin, our natures are fallen. He didn't talk about Christ's nature. Our natures are fallen. And we cannot make ourselves righteous. So the whole concept of our righteousness through obedience to commandments goes out the window. Since we are sinful and holy, we cannot perfectly obey holy law. We have no righteousness of our own with which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape from, for us. He lived on earth amid trials and temptations such as we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us and now he offers to take our sins and give us his righteousness. This is the message of the sermon, worship sermon, that is righteousness from God. It's not of God to which I measure myself. It is given to me from God. Okay, so it is his right. This is, this is Christ's righteousness message rather than my righteousness. And then she says this, if you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are accounted righteous. And this is every day. You know, that's the good news. Every day for his sake I'm accounted righteous if I give myself to him. And then this. Christ's character stands in place of your character. And you accept it before God just as if you had not sinned. Do you remember that picture during sermon I showed with this guy standing, the man standing in front of Angel, and Angel is asking him question, you know? I develop another picture, I should have put it on here. Uh, I tinkered with that picture. I replaced Christ with, that, 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 I replaced that man with Christ. That man is still there, but Christ is before him, behind him, on the side, above, below, and the Angel is not talking to me, he's talking to Christ. Okay, I'm there because the fact that we have free will requires judgment. But the angel is talking to Christ and Christ says, he's mine. That's it. So there's nothing to worry. It's a good news, right? So Christ's character stands in place of your character. That's right. Christ stands in place of my character and I, I'm accepted before God just as if I had not sinned. And this is not the end, okay? So this is the justification part. Now we have a sanctification part. Very often we think that justification is God's work and sanctification is my work, right? That I, I work on obedience and, and then I develop this uncertainty. Am I good enough? But that's not what she says. More than this, Christ changes the heart. So who does the sanctification for us? It's a Christ's work in us. Sanctification is his work in us. He abides in your heart by faith, if you let him. You are to maintain this connection with Christ. John 15, right? Stay, be with Christ. I mean, connected with Christ by faith and the continual surrender of your will to him. And so long as you do this, he will work in you to will and to do according to his good pleasure. She is quoting one of my favorite verses in the Bible in Philippians 2.13, that Christ does, okay, he, will, he does and makes us want to do things according to his good pleasure. It is Christ's work in us. So when, when Paul says, work out your own salvation, it doesn't mean that I'm obedient. It means that I need to focus my eyes on Christ because it is him who will work in me. Okay, so, so that's basically what she says. Then with Christ working in you, you will manifest the same spirit and do the same good works, works of righteousness and obedience. So who does it for us? It's Christ from beginning to the end, right? This is not us, not me. It is Christ from the beginning to the end. So, she says, we have nothing in ourselves of which to boast. We have no ground for self-exaltation. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us. That means we are covered by his righteousness and that is wrought by his spirit working in and through us. So, from beginning... From Christ calling us to Christ working with us as Christians, it is Christ's work in us through the Holy Spirit. 
So we can't say, okay, I obeyed commandments perfectly. I, I've obeyed commandments, God. I've done well. Okay, yeah, I'm, you just can't. That's not biblical teaching if you do. Okay, and let me conclude this. And I encourage you to read, read this again. This test of discipleship is an amazing chapter. The whole book is great. Okay, so she says this, and this is just wonderful. The closer you come to Jesus, the more faulty you will appear in your own eyes. What does that tell us about sinless perfectionism that we perfectly obey one day? That means I have not seen Christ. Uh, in, my, in my role as a professor, I had a lot of students and I taught on a master's level and doctoral level. So my students who came to the seminary, they were, pre they were in final stages of prepar preparation to be pastors. Okay, so this is not BA level, it was master's level. And I had students, one student who came to me and he said, I haven't seen for nine months. <clears throat> he actually said that to me. I haven't seen for nine months. And I was like, oh, really? I, I didn't have a heart to him. I said, you just did. Sorry. <laughs> but, so, so I did ask him a question. Okay, so Jesus is our Savior. Is, your, is Jesus your Savior? And he said, no more. He's my friend, but he's no more. I don't need a Savior anymore. Actual words. So when you read statement like this, the closer you come to Jesus, the more fault you will appear in your own eyes. I could read that to him, right? <laughs> Obviously, you are far, far, far away from Jesus, you know? For your vision will be clear and your imperfections will be seen in broad and distinct construct to his perfect nature. No deep-seated love for Jesus can dwell in the heart that does not realize its own sinfulness. So if you think better of yourself that you should, uh, then you have to rethink your relationship with Christ. Because the closer you come to him, the more you will see your imperfections and the more you'll want to depend on him, you know, the, the more you will be, uh, want to walk with him. The soul that is transformed by the grace of Christ will admire his divine character. But if we do not see our own moral deformity, and this is not before conversion, it's now. You see, I've walked with God for all of my life. And I still, if I come close to Jesus, I see who I am inside. I know who I am inside. <laughs> and there's a lot of ugliness there, you know. But the more I see, the more it draws me closer to Jesus. And, and then he covers me with his righteousness. And then he changes my heart. This is just like an amazing process, right? If we do not see our own moral deformity, it is unmistakable evidence that we have not had a view of the beauty and excellence of Christ. And, and I think this is, this is good news. A view of our sinfulness drives us to him who can pardon. And when the soul realizing its helplessness reaches after Christ, and this is just not one point of life, this is continual. This is, through, this is Christian life, you know. I always need Christ. Helplessness reaches after Christ. He will reveal himself in power. The more our sense of need drives us to him, and to the word of God, the more exalted view we shall have of his character and more fully we shall reflect his image. You know, for me, this is good news. <laughs> this is good news because I don't have to worry about my obedience anymore. I can focus my eyes on Christ, live with him, have him in my heart, uh, him being part of my life, daily life, and then he does it for me. From beginning to the end, like the author of Hebrews says, that Christ is the finisher and his author, the beginner and finisher of our faith, of our salvation. So I wish that that for you, uh, that, that Jesus will be that for you every single day of your life. All right? May God bless you. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can talk a bit. Any questions, friends? This is okay. quite obvious, you know, isn't it? Okay. Uh-oh, you're in trouble now. Ah. There's, there's one from there in the front here. All right. <laughs> now, uh, I was just thinking, you know, if James White died in 1881, do you think, and, and she commissioned that vastly different picture... Do you think her own journey was emerging as well with the yes. grace thing? Or do you think they were at odds with that? 
Uh, well, that's a big question within Adventism as far as Ellen White. Uh, you know, did she grow in faith? And was she, did she have mature Christian faith in the 1850s? Or later on, well, the historical evidence suggests that she was just like us, you know. She was a messenger of God, but she was human, you know, and she grew in her understanding of God and his grace. And I have a suspicion, you know, the church would never begin our church if not for James White. He was incredible organizer. He was a workaholic. He was, uh, he was a man totally, utterly, completely dedicated to the cause of uh, Christ, to the church, to developing the church, developing the organization. They basically devoted in the last years of his life entire earning to teach, the, to, to spearhead the message, you know. So they gave up on both of them, and especially he. He worked for free, essentially, but he killed himself. He was a workaholic by 18, 1881. He was basically a totally damaged man. But James White was also a difficult man. He was a type A personality. You know, choleric type A personality. He was not the easiest man to live with. And God still used him amazingly, right? To start our church. So I'm saying, that's why I said, before him, be, the church would have difficulty starting if not for him. God needed this type A personality, but he went too far. And he was subject of few testimonies mm -hmm. for working too hard. Yeah. Quite a workaholic. I think I that only when he died, Ellen White probably did not speak much about those themes like Christ's full divinity and Christ's righteousness because there were other more pressing issues at that stage. He died and she instantly commissions a different picture. Mm, mm, yeah. You know? I've got another question. Sorry. Um, so, you know, if she was really promoting that grace orientation in, in 80, 93, 83, yeah, 83, it, was there any momentum with that? You know, 1888 was still this explosive situation. It's interesting yeah. that that message in those years hadn't really taken, been taken on board. Yes, by it was. It was a very slow process because once we got addicted to obedience to commandments, it was very difficult to kick that addiction. You know, uh, very difficult. Uh, the problem was compounded because by 1870s, 1880s. Uh, we started bringing to church traditional Christians from other denominations who are familiar with the case of Christ righteousness and Trinitarian teaching. And they were also pushing the church in that direction, the new converts. So the old guard was guarding our Christ. Uh, we, are, we have our own righteousness. The new converts were pushing the other direction. And we've got those two streams and Wagon and John's embraced that Christ our righteousness. They, of course, went some wrong directions with the nature of Christ, but Ellen White embraced it and promoted that message together with them. I don't know if I answered your question, but... And, and finally, <laughs> <laughs> um, I understand that, you know, her coming to Australia was kind of a big squeeze from those above. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so was that over this issue of... It was over Christ? a variety of issues, but because she sided with Wagoner and Johnson, Christ's righteousness, she, uh, her presence became somewhat uncomfortable. Mm. And they just kind of sent her to Australia, just like, go to Australia, do your thing there. And in Australia, we've got this Christful divinity developing. She had peace to think about it. It was wonderful. It was not her teaching that pushed us into... We do not base Adventist teachings on, the, on Ellen White, but she was the pusher. And it was Prescott who actually went ahead and began to preach the full divinity of Christ eventually. So on the basis of deep Bible study. So yeah, that was exciting development. And I'm glad that today we are fully Trinitarian church. I think there's a question here. Oh. Someone else. <laughs> <laughs> Are you finished, Linnell? Can I go now? <laughs> <laughs> okay. he, he just had to say it, Linnell, right? <laughs> You're friends, right? I think. <laughs> they were friends. Um, you, and I mentioned before to you about Uriah Smith, how I was really surprised to see that he, his, what he had belief even at his death. But does that mean then that except for, to me, the belief that Jesus is my saviour, all these other beliefs that we as a church have are really open for discussion, that we 
Is there any ultimate truth uh, other than Jesus is my Savior? The whole idea of what we have as doctrines for the, of the church is to tell people what we believe as Adventists. It's not to hold us accountable, but to tell the world. That was the original uh, original idea. For the first time, we, uh, let me just back up. Adventists came out of other churches, organized churches, and they considered organization as a Babylon because organization kicked them out before 1844 and they, they had to form their own kind of communities of Advent, Adventist believers who believed in second coming in 1844. But they were all kicked out of their denominations. So when they formed after, after great disappointment, they didn't want to form any kind of organization. They were totally against organization, against any kind of creeds, against fundamental statements of belief, against anything, against organized ministry. They didn't want to have pastors, you know. They just had evangelists who would go from church to church. There was, it's another issue, ordination, right? We could talk about this, about how they develop. You have to invite me next time. <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk about ordination. But anyway, so they were very much against the whole thing. And then they, uh, they realized during the 1850s that they cannot proclaim the gospel without some kind of organization. So Ellen White and James White and Joseph Bates began to push organization to the great opposition of all the Sabbatarian Adventists at the time. About 50% of them left the church because of that issue at that stage, because James White, we need to organize. How can we own house worship houses, own publishing houses? Who owns publishing house? There was a case in, I um, can't remember exactly where it was, but a man donated the church, the, the land for the church, okay? And the church was enthusiastic about it, developed, built the church. It was just before we were organized. They built a meeting place, okay? But the man held the title to the, to the still to the, uh, to the land, okay? So the, the church was built, believers started gathering, and then men got a little bit kind of disenchanted with the church. One day believers came and there was a lock on the church, no more worships. It's his church, right? So, so that was the kind of issue. Who owns the churches? This church is not owned by you, it's owned by the conference, right? So that's the reason for all of this. Um, so nobody could claim ownership of this place except the institution, the church. So early Adventists were totally against that. So the time came in about 1870s, late 1860s, to talk about what do we believe as Adventists. We have only one creed, and our creed is the Bible, and that's it. James White said, and he's quoted on this, that we are people who obey the commandments, and keep the testimony of Christ. That's it. That's the only definition of Adventists. You know? But then you realize that when you teach stuff like anti-Trinitarianism or wrong understanding of this or immortality of the soul, then you realize, okay, no, 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 no. This has to fit with, with Advent message. So, so our doctrines are kind of like, like a mosaic of... They, they, they work together, you know? So they're not kind of like Jesus... Uh, Jesus uh, is my savior, and that's it. But then you have a next question, who is Jesus? Okay, so you have to develop an idea who Jesus is. Because if you say Jesus saves me, and, and, and he's just a philosopher somewhere out there sitting in a cave, and he saves him by giving me some knowledge, that's a wrong picture of Jesus. So you have to have a right picture of Jesus, and that where another teaching comes on, who is Jesus? And then you build the teachings uh, like, like second coming goes hand in hand with immortality of the soul. You know, we believe in second coming and so on. But Adventists were very cautious against putting anything in writing that would be uh, smack like a creed, you know, like, oh, this is what, whoa, whoa, whoa. they were really cautious. So finally, in the eight, late 1860s, they decided to put together teaching for, of, uh, you know what, I show you, I show you this, I think I know where to find it, my computer has a lot of stuff, but they put first ever uh, fundamental beliefs of Adventist church, but they put introduction to it that is very, very interesting. There it is, okay. Okay, let me see if, I, if it, it will open up. Okay, the introduction to this document, look at this. This is the, um, this is the first fundamental beliefs ever that Adventist Church put well, during, in 1872, okay? The fundamental principles that have sustained the work for the last 50 years would be accounted as an error. A new organization would be established, books of new order would be 
a written system of intellectual philosophy would be introduced, okay? So this is a quote, but here, yeah. Adventist beliefs have changed over the years under the impact of the present truth. More startling is the teaching regarding Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Many pioneers, including James White, Andrews, Uriah Smith, Wagoner, held to the Aryan or semi-Aryan view, which is the crisis created or kind of came as a secondary God, that is the Son at some point in time before the creation of our world was generated by the Father. The Trinitarian understanding of God, now part of our fundamental beliefs, was not generally held by early Adventists, even today, a few do not subscribe to it. So this is James William Johnson, another Australian, wrote this. Um, okay, and here is the introduction. This is 1872, the introduction to Adventist beliefs. And this is hugely important, listen to this. In presenting to the public this synopsis of our faith, we wish to have it distinctly understood that we have no articles of faith, creed, or discipline aside from the Bible. We do not put forth this as having any authority with our people, nor it is designed to secure uniformity among them as a system of faith, but is a brief statement of what is and has been with great unanimity held by them. We often find it necessary to meet inquiries on this subject and sometimes to correct false statements circulated against us and to remove erroneous impressions which have, uh, which have obtained with those who have not had an opportunity to become acquainted with our faith and practice. Our only object is to meet this necessity. As Seventh-day Adventists, we desire simply that our position shall be understood, and we are the more solicitous for this because there are many who call themselves Adventists who hold views with which we can have no sympathy, some of which we think are subversive of the plainest and most important principles set forth in the word of God, and, and so on. So, and they, then they go with the 23 teachings, okay? So what is the purpose of those teachings, the fundamental purpose of those teachings? We wish to distinctly present what we believe, what is held among us with great unanimity. So 28 fundamentals, sometimes we use it as a kind of thing that we clobber people with, but the role of seven-day fundamentals is fundamentally evangelistic. That's, that's it, you know, to tell others what we with great unanimity actually believe among Adventists. So about the other doctrines, we need them. We need them. But the doctrine about Christ, who is our Savior, is primary and what he accomplished for us. Um, John and then yourself, okay. Um, during your presentation, you actually mentioned about the Johns and Wagner, who were the uh, editors of the Arabian and Herald? Uh, no, Signs of the Times. Uh, Signs of the Times. So um, we understood they, they had a great contribution to the understanding of the uh, righteousness by five, even though they've been driven out, out of the church um, because of the controversy they it left, created. They left, and they, actually. Kind that's of, right. And yeah. also the, uh, <laughs> the controversy that erupted during the Indianapolis conference. Yes. So that was a big dispute. Well, Magona actually very soon in the early 90s rejected the teaching of uh, Sanctuary. All together, okay. and, and he embraced pantheism with Kellogg, yeah, and that's Kellogg. why he left. John Kellogg, yeah. So um, I believe the church acknowledged their contribution to the uh, understanding of the whole truth, even yes. that they left the church and they got mm -hmm. involved in some yes. other things. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. The Ellen White embraced the significant part of their message. Not everything. She did not embrace the perfectionism that they preached, but she embraced Christ's righteousness. De definitely. So there was great contribution to Adventism. Yes. Yes, Rutka. Oh. Is this on? Uh, recently I reread the book of Job and particularly in the first chapter, um, there's a theme that keeps coming up and it says God was, um, Job was a righteous man and he feared God and he shunned evil. He feared God and he shunned evil. He feared God and he shunned evil. It just, it's yeah. re repeated. And the latter part um, in, of that statement in, in, appears to imply that it was a very um, conscious, yes. repeated effort yes. to, to shun evil. I just wondered if you could comment yes, on that absolutely. in the context of what we've heard today about we, grace. We are called by God to shun evil, but shunning evil does not save us. That's it. Okay, that, that's, that's the thing. God is not, as my wife likes to say, God is not opposed to effort. 
And and when you read the new, can you can you well can you say it loud with Please, the microphone? God's not opposed to effort; he's opposed to earning. That's it. So our effort is essential. Okay, the Bible talks about. I mean, Paul talks about running, right? Like a like a Olympian running and towards the goal and so on. God does not oppose effort, but effort does not save us. We only saved by the blood of Christ. And when we when we have a definition of righteousness, that uh, Job was a righteous man, Abraham was righteous too, right? Was Abraham righteous? In Genesis 15, chapter uh, 6, we have definition how it happened. Abraham believed it was credited to him as righteousness. So he believed God and he was righteous because of belief. So, so you are righteous. If you believe God, embrace Jesus, walk with you are righteous. And I'm sure you shun evil. Uh, look, my own conclusion as I pondered those statements was that, first of all, Job must have had a, a, a great relationship with Correct. God. My own experience and, and what I've heard from others as well is that if you um, long to be close to God, but you don't shun evil, and it is a conscious effort, yes, you can't get course. close to God. Um, there is a, a, you know, in the New Testament somewhere it says, your sins have separated you from God. Correct. So, yeah, that, if that's you my do take not, on it. If you do not shun evil, then you place yourself in dangerous <laughs> ground, you know. It would be like me saying, uh, you know, I, I'm a smoker, I quit smoking, I never smoke, but I quit smoking, and so, but that I'm going around with my smoking friends to, and I'm breathing the stuff and I kind of like, you need to remove yourself from that position, you know? Uh, so, yeah? Uh, no. Okay, all, all right. So, yeah, yeah, I use, often use an example that our... In, okay, let me talk. <laughs> uh, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, uh, God uses a metaphor of marriage to represent relationship between him and people. It's like from the Garden of Eden to the very end of the Bible. Uh, so you have a, a Jerusalem coming down as a bride, prepared for the bridegroom, right? And so the church is the bride. Christ is the bridegroom. So throughout the whole scripture, the metaphor of marriage, of working marriage, is um, used for the relationship between God and his people. So in the middle of it, you've got prostitution, betrayal, all kinds of bad things. And God calls Israel his uh, beloved, his bride, you know. And, and, and who is Gomer? Gomer from Hosea. She just left. Why did prophet was asked to do that thing? To portray the relationship of God with, with, uh, with his people. So we can use the, the marriage as a metaphor for relationship with God. A well-functioning marriage. Sometimes marriages function badly. But when marriage functions as well, when two people love each other, when they're committed to each other, then, and, and then things happen in your life. You know, like I know commandments of my wife. She knows my commandments. She doesn't do things that I, we shun things that would hurt our relationship. I am with relationship in her. I don't want to do things that would hurt her. And she doesn't do things that would hurt me or, or, or something. We just don't push those buttons. And it becomes a kind of a second nature, you know. But that does, does not make our marriage, like we are not more married because I pick up my wet towel. I'm still married to Edita, you know, uh, type of thing. But I'd rather pick it up because it, it displeases her that I, I leave my wet towel on the floor. So I don't do this anymore. I haven't done it for many years. <laughs> you know? Because I'm in love, you know. And when you're in love with somebody, then, then the commandments of life effort marriage is an effort but if you love somebody you're willing to go through that effort you know for example if if edita spoke only german if when i met her and i didn't speak a word of german and i fell in love with her you know i would do everything i could to learn german as quickly as possible try learning german if you don't love anybody <laughs> <laughs> you know it's difficult it's a Tough stuff. Why, why should I study this thing? I remember I had to study German for my PhD studies. You know, it, it was terrible. So the whole two semesters I had to slog with those words and uh, uh, I hated German. But if I loved Edita and she only spoke German out two weeks, then I'd be speaking fluent. 
<laughs> you know, uh, you know what motivates, what the motivation is? So motivation is love. So if, if this works for us as human beings, that works with God and us in the same way. It's a parallel situation. So, so evil, I shun evil. Absolutely, I want to shun evil because I don't want to hurt my wife. And, and she does the same. But that does not mean that when we shun evil, then we will be married. We're already married. You know, within relationship, we already do those things that are required for good, well-functioning of that relationship. We do, it's effort. You know, it is an effort. I mean, it's much easier now after 31 years of being married. But at the beginning of marriage, the first year was tough to learn the rules of a relationship, you know? The same with Christian life, exactly the same. But, but when you come to Christ, he embraces you, and then you, you do things in order to maintain relationship, but not because you're not saved, you want to go to heaven, that's why I do things. So to, to be obedient, to go to heaven, is a wrong motivation altogether, you know? You want to go to heaven because you want to see God face to face and live with him forever, not, that's the main motivation, not I need to be obedient in order. That's kind of how I see salvation. <laughs> Have I answered your question? We can talk more. You're taking us to the airport tonight, so after Sabbath, so we'll talk more. Yeah. Yes, just a little more on that marriage bit. I think, isn't God amazing that he has given us marriage here on earth Yes. to understand his love? Yes. And he's given us children, and yes. he looks at, at, at us as his yes. children. How precious is that Absolutely. scenario? And when we make God the center of our marriage, then our marriages blossom and bloom. Exactly. And that's, that's, the, that's what he wants us to have a relationship and with. And that him. is why yes. Satan hates marriage. He does. And, and tries to destroy, destroy marriage thoroughly. Yes. Because marriage, good, well-functioning marriage is a witness to God's love. I, exactly. I can tell you honestly, I did not understand God's unconditional love until I married my wife. Yes. And she loved me unconditionally. And yes. I was like, really? You, yes. you love me just for who I am? Seriously? I couldn't believe it. Yes. You know? And I thought, ah, so that's how God loves me. And Edith, I can tell you about children. She, she, she's got experience with, with children. She, she learned about God's relationship to her when she was teaching the kids about God, you know, and bringing the, car, the kids in, the home, in our home. My question is, um, what happened to Butler in that scenario, the president? Yeah, G.I. Butler. Yeah, they went through, the G.I. Butler, they went through a period of, um, he was a very sick man, by the way. Mm. Uh, he couldn't attend to my memory the 1888 session because he was very sick. But soon after that, there was a big reconciliation among brothers and sisters. They just forgave each other because, the, because Minneapolis conference was a very angry conference. They just like, ah, blah. they were really angry. And uh, they treated each other in a very nasty way, unfortunately. But then, then everybody reconciled, but it took a while for the message of grace to seep in. To, to the rest of Adventism. Was he the one that eventually came back to Ellen White and apologized to her? I think so. I think he yeah. was the one that did yes, that. Yes, but, but he retired soon after that. Yes, he was very yeah. sick. And um, just where we are in the scenario of time now, near the, the end of, we think is the end, coming very close to us, and we are the church to evangelize, where do you see us? And how do you see us evangelizing in the most? Well, God called us to spread the three angels' message about his coming. Mm. That's our message. It's, it's about not just about his coming in the future. It's his coming to our lives right now. Yeah. We neglect that. Yes. that. That we need to walk with Jesus today, not just one day when he comes, you know. Uh, that's a bit of a neglect thing. But I believe that proclamation is still there. With he's coming. That the scripture is saying that that's what he called us to do. There we go. Oh, that's right. Um, it's a little bit of a, a change from what you've been talking about, but um, I guess tied into um, to what 
um, Rosalie was saying, um, in terms of um, where we are um, in, or, or maybe nobody really knows for sure, in terms of um, end time events, um, how do you see um, the current um, you know, situation with COVID and so forth and the, the apocalyptic type statements that are being made even by, um, you know, people who have no Christian faith. Um, we, it, it's, it's a difficult subject. The main thing is how we walk every day with God. Mm -hmm. You know, the end for any of us um, sure. could come tomorrow. But sure. um, Luther... Luther thought that, um, you know, he lived in these last days. And Paul <clears throat> said, you know, when we, are who, when we who are alive and remain, yes. you know, shall be caught up um, in the clouds to meet Christ in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Do you, do you sense that um, this, you know, what is happening now may be a blip and there could be quite a long further period of... <laughs> Of pain and suffering, or <laughs> you know, you know as far as I'm concerned, I wish Jesus came tomorrow yeah. or today. Yeah, yeah. That's that would be my dream, you know, that He comes and ends this suffering, ends this world, and 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 that we can go home. I would love that, you know. I I'm with Max Mace, you know, who Max Mace is heritage singer, so I've, I'm a devoted fan of early 70s and 80s, I grew up on this stuff. Every time Max Mace would, would stand up after the concert, he would make an appeal that we believe that Jesus is coming and please embrace Jesus, walk with him and so on. Um, you are absolutely correct when you stated that in the Bible, they believe they were living in a time of the end. And uh, I believe the time of the end occurred when Jesus left this earth, we're living in a time of the end. From the time that he left for heaven, we live in a time of the end. Um, I, pardon? Yeah. yeah, it is finished. So we are living, he said on the cross, it is finished. So we are living in a time of the end. And um, I see a lot of hype at this moment, totally unnecessary. Some people are now setting the date by 2027 20, uh, that Jesus is going to come. That's absolutely crazy. You know, I feel... Uh, this is the first time in my life that I experienced pandemic. But from reading of the history, this is not the first time something like that happened in the history of the world. As a, as a matter of fact, this pandemic is the bleep comparing to what happened in 1920s, right? That the Spanish flu where 50 million people died. This is nothing. I mean, yes, it's tragic and we have to be careful and I wear masks and I'm not a crazy person who rips masks and, oh, I won't wear masks and I won't, be sure, I won't have injection. I will never say that. I, I believe that we should be reasonable people who follow reasonable guidelines. Uh, but, uh, but more people died in 1920s from Spanish flu. There were great pestilences during medieval ages. The third of Europe was wiped out. I wondered what those people then thought it was time of the end, you know. World War I, World War II were horrific. You know what people thought? I remember a big excitement when Desert Storm in 1990 occurred. Suddenly everybody, King of the East is coming to Kuwait, and wow, wow, boom. And nothing happened, you know. I think what God wants us to live between two realities. I am coming, I promised, and your life is here now. Live with Christ every single day. Have him in your heart. Walk with him because your second coming may happen on the way home. You know? So God calls us to live with him now and not worry too much or speculating about the future. That would be how I would say. <laughs> Some people get too excited about every, every word Pope utters. It's suddenly a sensation, you know? No. Um. This is good, Darius. Um, if we could have all the um, tricky questions asked this afternoon, it would just make it so much easier for That's right. and Ask me for the rest of the year. Difficult. Yeah. Think about what I said, and next week, big questions to the pastor. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Darius, for your presentation. Um, we've talked a lot about uh, the Adventists' differing views on grace uh, in the church. Which is still oh, you're asking questions I didn't talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, we're, we're talking about uh, also how 
the church seems to have uh, varying views on on God. We've talked a lot about Jesus. Yes. yes. Uh, whether God is this stern yes. person that you've got to be careful of. Yes. Jesus is the good guy. We can be friends with him. But if you step out of line, if he's not in front of you, you're zapped. Yes. And is that uh, is that tie in any in any way to your message on grace? Absolutely. I think my wife could tell you more. My wife has a PhD in Christian education with discipleship theme and she, in her classes she was asking people what is your picture of God and everybody in the classroom would have a different picture of God and certainly um, I can tell you this much when you grew up in a harsh home in a, in a home where your dad and your mom were really harsh and difficult and unforgiving and I think this is how you will tend to view God in the future and it takes a lot of energy and thinking and praying for that to be reversed you know because i mean i just i just give you an illustration that i could use for a sermon i think i omitted that in my sermon when i was a student at andrews university uh, we had a first daughter born and uh, she was two years old and edith and i would try, we were thinking of getting a picture for her of jesus so she could Imagine Jesus take, taking care of her. Uh, so I went to the shop nearby town. There was a Christian bookstore. And I went in there and I found a perfect picture. It was just so perfect, I couldn't afford it. It was expensive. It was about $200 and I was living on $50 a week at that stage with Edita. And I couldn't afford that picture. But it was kind of lower to the floor. But it was beautiful, it was smiling Jesus, holding a two-year-old that looked exactly like my girl, blonde, little blue eyes, you know, looking at him with this beautiful, loving eyes, and he's looking at her and smiling at her. And, and I was looking at that picture, and then suddenly I realized, this is exactly how I hold my girl in my arms. So when my girl calls me daddy, that's how she will relate to God in heaven. And you know, it was like suddenly I had this, I was standing there and I was like, oh God, please give me wisdom. Please give me, because, because I will create a picture of God in her mind through my behavior, through my relationship to her, through my relationship to my wife and so on. And I was like, oh, it was just, it was like a huge aha moment for me in my life. Uh, you know, and uh, yeah, so, so I, yeah. You want to say something? Yeah, I just want to add, uh, you might have forgotten this, but when she was little, sometimes she'd be talking about Jesus and she would say, Daddy. And yeah. That's what she called Darius. So in her mind, Jesus and Daddy were somehow interchangeable. So, so that's a huge responsibility uh, as far as parents are concerned. So, so we parents have a way of shaping through our relationship with our children. We shape the picture of God in their minds, in their consciousness. And sometimes marriage doesn't work well. Or relationship between parents and children doesn't work very well. This is where the church should step in. This is the plan B that God has. Plan A did not work. Plan B is whether we show love to one another and we replace the wrong pictures of God in people's mind so that they can see the God of grace.